Horror in video games is often either very loved or very hated. You have Five Nights at Freddy's giving you nothing but jump scares, and then you have games like Darkwood, which make me absolutely and utterly terrified that at any given moment I'm going to die. And personally, I find myself to be the type of person that doesn't like either. I do not like jump scares at any given time because I feel like they are cheap, and I also do not like the kind of stress that makes you feel unsafe. I much more prefer stress that comes from overcoming challenges. But funnily enough, speaking of challenges, I did want to try and challenge myself this Halloween, or more specifically this October, and play as many horror games as I could so I can actually see what they are like, and also so I can get out of my shell and stop being a little pee-pee baby bozo. And that is exactly what I did. Over the course of October, I streamed myself playing four horror games, or rather three and a half horror games. Y you'll, you'll see. And this video is going to be me going over that experience, sharing my thoughts about each of the horror games, and also answering the question, do I like horror games now? So as we get into it, I'm going to be tackling this from worst to best game. And I already know that I'm going to be pissing off so, so many people. So let's just get right into it, shall we? Yes, that's right, the critically acclaimed horror game, Alien Isolation, is the worst one that I have played throughout the entirety of the month of October. And I will even let you know, I didn't even finish this game, it was that bad. And before you come at me with your pitchforks or laser blasters or whatever the fuck you want to have, I will say that I am more or less surprised as you, because I've heard so many good things about Alien Isolation, and there are plenty of YouTube videos and streams of people playing the game. Alien is a beloved franchise for its horror and other elements. So I had a lot of high hopes for the game. I thought it was going to be a great first start. But boy, was I not ready to be proven so goddamn wrong. So before I get into why I think Alien Isolation is the worst of the four games I've played, let me sing a little bit of its praises. First off, the first five hours are definitely the game's strongest point, because the sound design, the visuals, everything about those first five hours really sells how bad of a situation it is, and it creates such an atmosphere, and it builds an immense amount of tension to where if you know horror tropes, or if you even know Alien, you are constantly afraid of when the alien is going to show up and try to kill you, and that is fantastic. Secondly, when it comes to the crafting in the game, I will first preface that there is no winning with me in crafting, it's just not something I like. However, the resource management aspect of it, where every tool shares components with other tools, is a very good way to make sure the player manages the resources appropriately, so that way they can choose on what is appropriate for the next situation. And obviously, the sound design, the visuals, the graphics, the voice acting, all of it is fantastic, but I feel as though that is a given, so I'm not really going to count it, but I will say it for posterity. And, um... The hacking minigame is pretty cool. Unfortunately, though, that is where all my praises stop. Everything after this is my gripes or actual criticism with the game. And the first one may actually just color the reason why I have any other to begin with. And it's that Alien Isolation is what I call a coward survival horror game, where you physically cannot fight back against most if not all of the threats, and you have to hide, like Amnesia or Outlast. And I know that's not entirely accurate to Alien Isolation, but we'll get to that. But it does still bleed into another problem I have, which is if you kill the player, then any fear or tension that you've been building up gets killed, and you have the potential to be replacing that with frustration. And this happens all the more consistently the more you kill the player, which happened a lot for me, especially on mission number five. And granted, that one I will call me being stupid. However, it gets much, much worse later on in the game. Not only that, but it does also appear as though that the alien script and its AI is a lot more evident based on certain points in the game, such as reading the roster on Mission 5, or... Well, you know, I'll just tell you exactly what happened. And I'll try to be brief, but there is a lot to it, so bear with me. So Alien Isolation teaches you the following things. 1. Humans want to kill you. 2. 
the androids want to kill you. Three, the alien wants to kill you, but you cannot kill the alien. You can, however, kill the androids and you can kill the humans. You were even given a gun, a melee weapon, and a flamethrower in order to do so. And you can craft EMP items to disable the androids. On top of this, you are educated that there is a security system that is connected to the androids, or at the very least, implies it. And with these lessons, the game has let you decide what approach you want to take, so long as it veers somewhere within the stealth category. However, within my last 30 minutes of playing the game, which is around the halfway point, it tosses out all of that except for the alien will kill you and you cannot kill the alien. Because in order, the game puts a synth in front of you, then humans who shoot you even if you listen to their demands, and a security system. The synth turns out to be non-hostile when all previous synths, save for one you manually turn on, were hostile. The humans are blocking your single path towards your goal, and the security system alerts the alien rather than the synths. And when you do the logical thing of either defending yourself against the humans, or taking out a single synth so that it doesn't chase you, the alien will instantly come out and try to kill you. And to top it all off, as soon as I open a door, the alien immediately rushes me and kills me, with no warning from the motion detector, which is supposed to tell me if the alien is nearby. And that's where I stop playing. So to put it briefly and simply, Alien Isolation offers an incredible opening for a horror game, but then it proceeds to either lie to you about the lessons it teaches early on, or it silently changes the rules of the game without ever telling you and punishes you for not knowing that the rules have changed. And that is why Alien Isolation is the worst horror game I played in October. Its opening was fantastic and absolutely a strong suit, however that alone cannot carry the game and therefore I cannot recommend it despite the fact that it got me in the mood for horror games. But now, let's move on to the next game, which, while it does have similar gameplay, is far, far more enjoyable. Don't worry, love. Just wait there and relax. Someone will come for you soon. Now, I'm fairly certain that none of you have heard of Lenpo, and if you have, it's most likely because you're a mythology nerd. I myself have never even heard of it until a viewer in my chat actually gifted me the game and recommended me to play it. And I gotta say, I am pleasantly surprised by this game. While you can say that this is just another walking simulator but in a creepy forest and with some spooky imagery, I feel as though that the environment design, the atmosphere, the puzzles, and the mythology used put it a little bit above that, and I really appreciate it. However, let me go into the specifics. The first thing I'd like to praise about this game is a little bit related to its atmosphere, and that is the way that it actually sells the environment that you're in, which, on the face of it, is just a random old forest. However, it is a magical otherworld ran by the goddess Lenpo, and because of that, it basically has a Feywild vibe to it, foam boots appearing out of nowhere with a fake voice mimicking your wife, radios out in the middle of nowhere commenting on your situation, just simply wisps floating in certain places, asking as guides for you. All of it gives off very, very heavy vibes of being in the Feywild, and I personally love that, especially with the atmosphere the game builds. And while there is a lot that goes into it, there is one element that I think really puts it above the rest, and that is the bell. This is new. Oh, that's Lempo. Hi, Lempo. Does he follow me? How do I hide from Lempo? Now, I'm not sure how much you will actually be able to see on YouTube with that, and also it may have seemed that I wasn't scared at all. However, what I saw was a weird, rotten figure, and when that bell went off, my instincts immediately kicked in. Oh no, there's danger there and I was keeping calm, but I was actually quite nervous that I just ran into Lenpo and they were to come kill me. And that's what the bell does. It tells you that danger is near, but it will not tell you what the danger is, or where exactly it is. And as we all know, fear of the unknown is the strongest fear. So if you know there's danger, but you don't know where it is, it really amps up the terror. 
but unfortunately it does get diminished a little bit when you constantly are cycling back around things that are dangerous. Like in the swamp there's this weird monster and it constantly is going to be setting off your bell and you know exactly what's causing it. So it does get annoying, but in concept the bell is excellent. The other notable thing that Limpo does do quite well is its puzzles because you have a lot of different puzzles throughout the entirety of the game, and they all vary wildly in difficulty and in creativity. Like, in the beginning of the game, it's actually very easy, and it more or less gives you the answer right in front of your face. However, I was stupid and didn't figure it out for two hours. Then you have the obelisks, which are just simply one, two, three, four. And then you have this God's Forsaken eyeball spinning puzzle, which requires two PhDs in trigonometry to understand. But all of them are presented in a very interesting way and give a little bit more of a flavor to the environment that you're in, as well as providing actual progress for you in your journey throughout this place. And finally, the game does a very good job of establishing the conflict that caused everything that you see before you, which to boil it down very simply, the Catholic Church is bad and it corrupted the pagan faith, and it caused Limpo to go crazy. And there is more nuance and detail to it, but that would be spoilers, and I'm simply here describing my experience with these games and if they've made me like horror games. Which, to give it briefly, I would say yes, it definitely helped my appreciation of horror games. However, that is about all I have to say about Limpo. It is definitely a good game, but it doesn't do enough spectacularly or dreadfully to where I feel like I can say more about it but I would highly, highly, highly recommend playing it. But now let's move on to the next two games we have, and these ones I would personally describe as pure art. Omori was a game I had very little knowledge about. I knew that it had a cute art style, I knew that it involved depression, and I knew that some VTubers used a model inspired by Omori's art style like this. So I was already going in with very little expectations of what would happen or how good it would be, and not only were they subverted, they were actually surpassed. Like, even with the beginning of the game, it both tells you exactly what the game is gonna be about and what it contains, but it also subverts your expectations on what you actually may think is gonna be in the game. In the opening, everything is black and white, you have this very cursed looking sketchbook containing lots of horrific drawings that a child should not have, but then, shortly after, you find yourself in a neon, happy dreamland with your friends, and you're playing in the park, and everything is all super happy. But then, not much later, we go right back to being creepy and possibly depressing. Omori is a game that took me by surprise with its duality. First off, you have a cutesy little JRPG where you can go helping your little dream friends with their missions, but then you find yourself in the real world and you're tackling your fears and the fallouts of a tragic event that happened within your life. Both of these offering excellent breaks from one another and advancing the story in a very fluid and emotional way. But it's not just the gameplay. What you're hearing right now is very likely to be a happy-ish sounding song for the game soundtrack, but you contrast that with the rather abrupt and dark turn that happened just a few seconds ago, and that is what Amori does. It gives you plenty of one thing, but then it pulls it back, and then it lets you experience the other for a little bit. All in service of creating peaks and troughs in your emotions, giving you extreme happiness, sadness, frustration, anger, confusion. All the while, you're asking, what happened? What's going on? Why am I experiencing this? Why are characters acting this way? All these questions have answers, and you find them by exploring the dream world, or interacting with people that were formerly your friends in the real world, and connecting with them again, as people also going through very similar things as you. And that is honestly Omori's greatest strength. The game has been praised for its depictions of trauma and depression, 
and while I personally cannot relate to that, I can still say that I was deeply invested with the characters and the story, and I got so emotional that near the end of the game on stream, I broke down into tears while trying to voice act one of the characters. And when a game actually portrays its message and its story in such a way that it causes me to experience such an intense emotion like that, I would elevate that game past the point of being a game and into being art. So, regardless of anything else I say, let that be the main takeaway of whether or not you should play Amori and if I recommend it, which I wholeheartedly do. I came into it expecting a pure horror game and for it to affect my opinions of horror games in general, which I guess it helped with the idea of me liking horror games, but honestly, I would hardly even call Amori a horror game. I would call it purely an emotional work of art, and you should absolutely play it. And this is not even talking about the actual JRPG gameplay of it all, because while it is nice and it is creative, I feel as though that even with it being the most amount of time you spend in the game, it really does not matter when you actually look at what the game is about and what its strong points are. Although I will leave this one clip just simply because I find it hilarious. Hundred and fifty-two damage! That is officially the highest damage we have done! That is officially the highest damage we have done in this game! Twelve hundred and fifty-two damage! I... Fuck that. Uh, I fucking love making Aubrey my superstar in this team. And with that, I feel as though I've kept my thoughts about Amori very brief but concise, and I really, really encourage all of you who watch this video to go play Amori. It is an absolute beautiful work of art, and everybody needs to see it. But there is still one game left, and this one has very easily become one of my top five favorites of all time. For any of you who know me personally, from other streamers' chats, or you follow me on Twitter, you know that I am obsessed with Signalis. There is so much I want to say about this game, and that I already have said, but I will try to keep it brief here. So before I start singing this game's praises for who knows how long, let me say this to convince you to go play the game. When I finished this game on stream, I said, yeah, that was a masterpiece, but I don't know if it will have a long-lasting effect on me. But now here I am, completely brain-rotted on Signalis, ranting and raving about it, and trying to convince all of you to go play it. But regardless of that being effective in convincing you or not, do know that this game is very easily spoiled, and everything I'm going to be talking about here, while it is going to be as vague or as early as possible in the game, I just want to warn you. So if you're curious, stop the video here, Go buy Signalis, go play it, and then come back to hear what I have to say. And now for the rest of you that have either played Signalis, don't care about spoilers, or are not convinced yet, let's get down to it, shall we? The first thing I want to talk about is the game's puzzles, because across all the games I've played, tabletop, video games, etc., these are some of the best puzzles I have experienced in any game. To summarize them briefly, it is that they make you feel like a goddamn genius, dude. The best early example I can give is in Chapter 1, where you have to find the four elemental keys and the gold key. The amount of layers that this puzzle has is insane, and I absolutely love it. The first layer is that there are the four aforementioned elemental keys, and initially, I didn't think much of it, but as soon as I found the water key in the flooded room, I immediately thought, Oh, so this is how we're going to be getting all of them. And then you find the fire key in the furnace, you find the air key in the vent, and you find the earth key embedded in a rock. And if you realize that ahead of time, then you look at these new spots where the keys are, and you're like, Oh my god, yeah, that's what it's doing! I've been looking for this key, hell yeah! 
And then the second layer is what has to be done with the Earth key, because you can't get it out of the rock, you have to use the blank key and copy the Earth key. But how do you do that when the Earth key is embedded and you can't see what it is? And that is where you use the X-ray in order to actually see what the pattern on the keycard is. But wait, how are you going to remember it? Well, you could just write it down and draw it yourself, but wait, the game gives you a photograph mode with a tool. And how do you get this tool? You solve a correlation puzzle using the keypad and a code and putting letters to numbers. Which you could do by finding the codes in another part of the game! And that's just one component to this big old puzzle with the door. There are still several other puzzles involving this door and how to get the other keys in order to access it. That's just one section of the game, not even a whole chapter. Every part of the game has puzzles like this, where you have small ones and you have big ones, and they all feed into each other, and when you finish one, it gives you the tools to access another, and it reminds you how you can take on another, and it forms these connections in your brain, and it makes you feel like a genius. And that's just the gameplay. The horror elements are also absolutely incredible. Signalis is a survival horror game, but unlike Alien Isolation, Outlast, or Amnesia, you are not expected to run and hide from every little thing that you see. Instead, you'll be given a variety of weapons to deal with the horrors that you'll be finding throughout this game. But the survival elements of this game is deciding which weapons you want to take with you, how much spare ammo do you want to bring, do you want to bring any heals, which key items are you going to bring, what tool do you have equipped, because each of these will take up one inventory slot, and by default, you have six inventory slots. However, thankfully, due to a recent update, you now have access to more inventory slots if you so choose. Which, by the way, was the one thing that I said needed to be done in order for the game to be perfect in my eyes, and now it's done. But these survival elements do also play into the horror, because the enemies get back up if you don't permanently kill them, which means every encounter is a risk assessment if you have enough bullets or if you want to spend those bullets if you have a difficult section coming up. So it creates this incredible tension every single encounter that you have, and even when you're walking past corpses because you don't know if and or when a body is going to get back up and make your life a nightmare. And while you're navigating these halls worried about that stuff, your only companion being these cameras that follow you, all the while a very somber and creepy track plays, or perhaps not even anything and you just hear Elster's footsteps on the cold, dark halls of the facility. Even then, considering what I just told you, I never found myself scared while playing the game. I found myself stressed, I found myself feeling tense, I found myself feeling disturbed and unsettled with almost every single thing that happened both in terms of the plot and with the visuals that were being given to me at any given time. Two early examples I can give are actually the dead Yule unit that you find early on in Sierpinski, where it described her bio components being degraded and having these pustules coming out. The second is that undulating breathing lump of flesh in the kitchen where you found the other Yule unit chopping up a body. The first one evoked my imagination and made me think of just how horrible and gruesome that scene would actually be. The second actually showed me something truly disturbing, but never a jump scare or anything of the sort, and it just made me feel unsettled. I've never interacted with it on stream, but if you do, the text that pops up is that the thing is actually breathing, which compounded with what you see makes it feel so wrong and terrible, and I love that. And then there's the story. I sadly can't talk a whole lot about it, because this game is very easily spoiled, the story especially so. However, I definitely would say that the emotional investment I had in it is similar to that of Amori, but instead of me being sad or happy, I was more on the edge of my seat trying to learn what happened next. Or what happened before, because this game's world building and its lore is excellent, some of the best I've ever seen. I even said this when my friend Snackies asked me for my thoughts on the game since that he is reviewing it currently, is that every single little bit of this game, especially the storytelling and the world building, has a PhD thesis level of thought put into it. And the shocking thing is that this game was made pretty much just by two people. Yes, they had other engineers and producers and localizers to help, but it was actually mostly made just by these two people. And there's still so much I want to talk about this game with more and more people, but I've already spent seven minutes talking about it at this point, and that's longer than any other game I've talked about in this video so far. So I think 
I'm going to leave it there. Signalis is a genuine masterpiece, it is a work of genius, it is a work of art, and it is one of my new favorite games of all time. I'm so glad that more and more people are discovering the game now, and I genuinely hope that what I've talked about here today will encourage at least one of you to go play Signalis, because it is well worth your time, it is well worth your attention, it is well worth your 15 to 20 dollars. And so, we come back to the question I posed at the beginning of the video. Do I like horror games now? And I feel as though that if you've watched through the entirety of this video, you know that the answer is a resounding yes. But there is a little bit of nuance to it. I do want to first simply say that in general, I am no longer scared to play any given horror game, more or less, because I can now see that there is a lot of artistry that goes into this genre specifically when compared to a whole lot of others. There are still some aspects that I do not like, such as overuse of jump scares or putting the player in perpetually powerless predicaments. Especially if you change the rules on them, don't tell them, and then punish them for not acting in accordance to these rules. But when the games don't do that, and they respect you as a player and as a human being, and they try to connect with you on an emotional level, even if it's through fear, that is when this genre truly shines and can create such amazing works of art. I decided to do the challenge of playing horror games all throughout October because I wanted to broaden my horizons and stop being such a scaredy cat, but I did not expect to be playing games that left a deep impression on me and I will cherish for years and years on end. And my hope after making this video is that first of all you go and play these games, but secondly, that you also try some games that you were curious about but weren't quite sure on, because who knows, maybe you'll find something that you'll love and have a new favorite, like I did. And hello to all of you that made it to the end of the video. I don't have any plans or scripting for this part. I just wanted to talk and thank you for watching it all the way through, or at the very least, skimming through, finding good bits, and then coming to the end here. It does mean a lot that you actually did at least some of that to give me the watch time there. This is about my third or fourth very highly edited video, but unlike the Destiny one or the D&D one, I had a very, very clear vision of what I wanted to do, and I was very excited to get working on it. The whole reason I even made this video, honestly, was because I was just ranting and raving about Signalis during Snacky's streams, which, by the way, go follow Snacky's on Twitch and go watch him on YouTube. He's a great friend of mine, he's a very entertaining dude, and he's gonna be doing some great reviews. But when it comes to everything else in this video, I just realized I had a lot to say, because Alien Isolation was a big disappointment to me, and Amori and Signalis kind of blew me away with what they did. And after ranting and raving about Signalis, I just thought, hey, why not make a video on it? And I did, and all the ideas kept flowing and flowing and flowing, and I had a really good idea of what I wanted to do. 
And then I got to the end with that little edit there between the Signalis opening and Omori images, and I thought, oh, hang on, this is a really creative thing I can do. And if you're watching this video all the way now, you probably also will see on my channel the edit on its own. Uh, I am very, very proud of that. It is probably one of the best creative things I have made thus far, short of any little bits in this video. So I do hope that you liked what the video contained, even if you may disagree or I wasn't that convincing. I at least hope I entertained you. But if you actually did like what you saw, you liked what I had to say, or if you were curious to see how else I'm playing games, then you can follow me on Twitch, twitch.tv slash double lucky. I do a lot of different streams there. I often play a new game once a month or something, depending on how long it takes me to get it. And if I have something I want to say involving that game, then you'll probably be seeing the video of it soon. I'm very tempted to make more Signalis videos, and maybe even an Amori video, because legitimately those games were absolutely incredible, and I love them so, so much, and I am serious when I say you should go play them. They are more than worth it. So, um, yeah. Thanks for watching. Hope you like and subscribe, all that stuff that you hear people ask about. I'm not gonna tell you to, but if you do it, I'll like it. <laughs> Have a great day, everybody. I'll see you in whatever next video I do, maybe even on stream. Come say hi if you'd like. And, uh, yeah. Bye-bye.